Well, hello. My name is Jim Carlton, and as you anticipate, we're going to start a project together, which I think is going to be kind of fun. It's going to be a trip back through history a little bit. Not exactly accurate history, but kind of history. Uh, but before we do that, we need to uh, get a little bit of background, a little bit of historical background. Now, I happen to be leaning against one of many replicas in the United States and all over the world of what was called the Wooden Wonder or the Petroleum Right Wagon, which was built in Germany in 1885 by uh, German industrialist Gottlieb Daimler and his assistant, a brilliant engineer named Wilhelm Maybach. Up until the 1880s, uh, engines of any sort would have been steam and they would have been cumbersome and big. They would have been used for powering locomotives and uh, large pumping uh, or just power plants. In 1884-ish, Gottlieb Daimler left uh, the factory that he had uh, been the head of and he and, and his assistant went into a garden shed and they built a small gas powered engine for the first time in history. Actually, it was powered by benzene, which is a higher dis distillate of gas, but nonetheless, we will call that gasoline. It was an uh, internal combustion uh, four-stroke engine, which developed a breathtaking 600 RPMs during a time when anything else would have been maybe 50 RPMs, and it developed half of an actual horsepower. And having built that engine, they built a wooden test bench, a rolling test bench, which looked very, very similar to this. This is a reproduction of, of the world's first gas-powered vehicle. Uh, this one isn't quite accurate in all of the details, but then none of them really are because the original burned in a fire in 1903, and so there are no originals in the world. So that being said, uh, I wanted you to get a look at what, what really existed before we start building our, our fun project, which is basically going to be a, a, a project made of art and a lot of ad lib and artistic license, but we want the thrill and the feel of actually duplicating that 14-kilometer that ride that Gottlieb's son Paul, Paul Daimler, actually took. So enough said on this. Let's move on and get started. The first thing that we need to do is get some proportions to our motorcycle of what we're going to build. And uh, I've been asked before, just how is that done? And the first thing we work off is the size of the wheels. Now we happen to get two Amish buggy wheels, and they were 38 inch in diameter, which is bigger than really what I wanted. I was hoping to get some smaller ones, uh, because Daimler's original bike, they were probably about 26 inches in diameter. But anyway, having got these great, delicious 38 inch uh, diameter uh, wheels, uh, I thought, well, let's just make a nice big proportion replica that's that's a lot, lot bigger. It'll look really neat in parades and fairs and things like that. So what we have to do is lay it out, and now if you look down here, I've got on the floor a uh, basic layout of what we're going to do. This is a 38-inch diameter wheel. This is a 38-inch diameter rear wheel here. And this green is the size of two wooden construction ramps that I fished out of the mud, which would make great wood to make the motorcycle rails out of. So if you'll see the pink, the pink lines are the shape in proportion of the uh, motorcycle frame. So everything within the perimeters of these green lines, which is the board, I will saw out and that will be, two of those will be the rails for the motorcycle. And then we'll make these, these, uh, these other pieces and, and the fork and all of that also. But this is basically how we get the layout. What I'm going to do is uh, cut these out of this cardboard, and I will lay them on the plank, trace out these templates, and then we will band saw them out, and then we will have our rough, rough cut uh, rails. Okay, well, oak is heavy, but it's strong. 
the other ones in the shop, we'll head on over and start sawing them out. Okay, the other day, we went ahead and made a big diagram schematic, full size, and we said we were going to cut it out and make templates so that we could start cutting out our wood, and this is it. Here's a template, and uh, this is that oak that we got out of the, uh, the plumbing shop. So, I'm just going to take a big magic marker and go around it, and then we're going to be cutting it out. Okay. This is a metal cutting band saw, and for all practical purposes, it doesn't know whether it's metal or wood. But what we have here is a real, uh, real coarse tooth blade, and we're going to be using this blade a lot to cut a lot of wood here. And then we're going to go back to a finer tooth blade to uh, cut our metal later. Now the difference between cutting metal and wood is wood, you go real fast, speed-wise. Metal, you go real slow, sawing. And that holds true for drill presses and other metal working uh, aspects too. So I'm going to put this blade on here, and uh, next thing you know, we're going to be sawing a lot of pieces for our crank. Continuing on with uh, one of the regular. until I have this, these, these pieces. And that's how I get that. Uh, you can make flutes on columns by running it diagonally or different angles to get different widths and then bring the blade up accordingly. So that's what we got. Now let's go down to the shop and uh, see how to attach them. A moment ago, we sawed these scallops, or however you want to say it, into this wood. And then I went ahead and I band sawed this out. Uh, yes, we already demonstrated the bandsaw, so there's no need for you to watch that. But the idea is, on the rail, we're going to have the downward legs put on here. Now these are what are called centering do uh, doll pins, I guess. Centering pins. Let's call them centering pins. And I've drilled these are doll pins. They're fluted doll pins. You may see the little tiny flutes. When they go into wood, all those little grooves hold the, hold the glue better, and they get a better bite. Now, I want to put these doll pins in and have them line up and catch in here. So when I glue this on, it'll, be, it'll have like pins holding it together. But I don't know where these holes are going to go here unless... I use these centering pins. So by pre-drilling these holes halfway to the depth of these pins, I will insert the centering pins like so. I will line it up about where I want it to go. I will put this on top. And I will hit it. Then you will see that I have these dipples. And these, because of the pins, should line up exactly where these pins would go. Now, 
I would come over here to the drill press and I would drill these holes on these ones to a predetermined depth, lining up in the uh, dipples that we have. In the uh, course of the whole bike with the uh, cross members and the legs and putting the nose together, I will use about 75 of these dowel pins, these dowel rods, whatever you want to call them. Okay, this is a dry run. Put these in here. We drill these holes here. They should line up going on. Now, in the course of the uh, real event, I would have all this stuff just steeped in nice wood glue. And I'm using, uh, I'm using Elmer's aliphatic, uh, that kind of yellowish uh, wood, gr wood glue. Uh, I've used Gorilla Glue, and uh, I will be using epoxy for uh, filling. But for now, I would be using Elmer's glue on here. And these, if I set this on, Okay, I've got, they all line up. And then I would, uh, I would go over and C-clamp all the pieces together and we would have a pretty solid leg. We would have the glue come out to the side. This is all gonna get sanded, this is all tapered. Uh, this is just to show you the principle of uh, fastening this stuff together. Okay, I had to turn the big air compressor on. It's back in the secret room, so I think we can get started now. Tediously taking off paint off of Amish buggy wheels. This is the frame. It's still rough, but you can see there's a lot of pre-drilled holes. Uh, not all of them, but I've already made some of the brackets. But we will go back to the metal work um, in a little while. Right now, I want to show you the frame. Now, the the uprights, remember when we took the uh, table saw and we cut out these, these curves right here? And then we said we were going to dowel, pin all of this stuff together. Well, there's about 75 dowel pins uh, in this. They, they put all these pieces together, and I've used epoxy so I could have it mush out of the cracks. Uh, and, 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 okay, it'll show up in the stain, but this isn't that kind of project where I'm worried about. But this is basically the frame. Uh, Going to be a rear wheel, of course, and a front wheel. Already I have this metal head race that I made in. It's got wings that go underneath. I've got this pushed up with epoxy and there's there was wings that went up in there and then these bolts right here will go through and hold that all together and the fork of the front wheel will sit up in there. Meantime you'll notice down here a lot of these scallops and curves cut out they all got to be sanded yet and we haven't even talked about stain but I did that with a router and uh, I don't think I need to demonstrate routing wise, but we're going to have to graduate all these curves and uh, just make this thing more graceful. But basically, this is the frame. Okay, uh, we're to the point now. The uh, the frame is is pretty well shaped. Uh, I'm just doing graceful stuff. It's kind of like putting the aesthetics or the art into it. All of this, all of these curves have to be graduated where they go into each other. Just a lot of sanding. Uh, not really unpleasant work. It's just time consuming. Now, if you come around here, 
you'll see, uh, besides, like I say, I've had so many dowel pins going in everything like we showed before, but I've got pieces all bolted on. Uh, this comes out to hold the motor, which didn't, un unfortunately didn't fit quite back in there, so I had to make a ledge, but you can see what's going on here. And uh, one more thing, it's a better chance for you to see the layers of wood that have come in here. They're all sandwiched together, again, with dowel pins and, and going to have through bolts. And if we can come right down here and look right down here, I didn't show you before, but see these these ledges. This isn't uh, dovetailing because they're not flared out, but it's squared. And I cut all of that in with a milling machine, these slots, and they had to line up because they go the whole way. They're not just artificial on the outsides. And I squeezed them in uh, with epoxy and let it ooze out. And then around here in the front, I put a big, long, hairy lag bolt in there to pull this nose in tight so that it didn't need all this extra piece, but I thought it would not be nice bringing these curves around. You can see the grease fitting that uh, is in the uh, bottom of the head race. There was no point in taking it out right now. I will before I start staining, which should be soon. Okay. Well, we have, uh, we have the frame sanded, stained, and satin uh, varnish. I want to show you an example of uh, some of the bracket work that we have to do. Now, this was a big slab of steel, and I sawed it out on the bandsaw. This shape sawed all of this out. Uh, here's another one. Actually, this had been like a piece of uh, U-channel all the way along there. And I kept these pieces here, and I sawed this out. The square holes, uh, carriage bolts, when they go in, they, uh, they will fit in these square holes and not turn when you're putting the nuts on the other side. So I filed all, you know, I drilled a hole, and then I filed them square. Lots and lots of that kind of work. Uh, the point of all of this is, this bracket, I welded these wings on. And a little crummy, crummy weld job here, but on the outside, I kind of ground them, and I'll fill them probably with putty. I'm not the greatest welder, but my stuff holds, and I, I, I know that I'm not the greatest. Some people don't know that. And I uh, welded this thing, tapped that for threads so I could screw this in. Now, you're wondering what all this is about, but... I won't bore you by doing a whole lot of this kind of stuff. I uh, built this up and welded this, this stud in here. And what's going to happen is these will go on here like this. This bolt will go in here and screw in. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, it's screwing in. I won't put it in all the way now. But the point is the little wheel... For, these are for the uh, the outer wheel uh, balance wheels that will keep the uh, the bike upright, and that wheel will go in this in this here. There's one on the left side of the bike, underneath, and one on the right side, and then they will pivot up and down as the bike pushes and pulls back and forth. These will pivot up and down, and this end. Another square carriage bolt hole. These end are spring-loaded into the front of the cross member of the frame. So it will be spring-loaded so that this, this bolts to the bottom of the frame, and this piece with the wheel pivots up and down like that. Okay, we got it. That's an example of a lot of the kind of bracket work that uh, just is going on that won't show. Okay, one more for the road. This project got a million brackets, and uh, I just wanted to show you a couple of them so you get a feel for what this is all about. This is going to be the shaft 
that goes in the back of the seat that will have the pivot. There'll be a brake pad on here, and this will have a lever going to the front of the bike. And when you pull the lever on the front of the bike, that will pull this, and the brake shoe will act as a skid against the rear wheel. And that's how, it, that's how the brakes go. Then, this goes on here, and this has another lever which will go to the front, and this will work the clutch. This will pull this way, and this has a le lever that goes down to the idler pulley, and when you pull this up like that, that pulls that idler pulley up and tightens the belt, thus you start to move. When you push that down, the opposite happens, it loosens the belt, and the engine can turn, and it's like not, not going anywhere. But you can see, uh, uh, let's see, the bolts that I put in here, whenever I can find them, I will use square-headed bolts rather than uh, hex CAD-plated stuff, just because I want to stay in the theme of the 1800s. But you can see, once again, all of this stuff is sawed out on a metal cutting bandsaw, and I think uh, we either demonstrated it or will before it's all done. And then there's some of my, uh, again, my, my wonderful weld, which will fill in with uh, putty so that it looks more wonderful. These happen to be taped over, because I'm going to paint, uh, taped over grease cups. You put the grease in the cup and you uh, turn that down on, on, on the threads of this, and it will squeeze grease into the shaft on both of these so that these will be these will be lubricated. All right, one of the things that we've got to talk about is the fact that even though it's a wooden motorcycle, uh, there's going to be a whole lot more metal work than there is woodwork in it. And it's going to be a lot of bracket making. We saw the bandsaw we were using. Uh, it's a metal cutting bandsaw back when we were cutting out the wood. And we were just using a different, more coarse blade to cut the wood. And as I said before, uh, when you cut metal, you go slow. When you cut wood, you go fast. And that's the same as whether you're drilling it or sawing it or, or a lot of the uh, uh, aspects of the work. So uh, just to show you, we'll go through making one metal bracket. Uh, and you'll see later on where this bracket goes. So, uh, But I made a template of what I thought I needed. And I traced it out kind of roughly with a magic marker. And again, this is kind of an art project. Uh, it's the idea of graceful curves and making metal uh, brackets and things, it's, it's actually probably more, uh, more art than it is uh, mechanical. So let's go ahead. Oh, and this is uh, what this is. This is kind of a paraffin, sort of a wax type of thing that I lubricate the blade with. I don't use oil, but I lubricate it with this sort of wax type uh, substance. Beeswax works good too. And that helps the blade to go around curves and things, and we'll see what we have. So here we go. I gotta kind of find my way cutting in first. I probably will have cut 100, 150 feet of uh, steel, making brackets and such, cutting off pieces of bar stock and all that sort of thing before the project's done. that show up. That's the uh, rough outline of the brackets. It's all got to be ground down. Then it's going to be tapered and all this kind of stuff. Holes, a hole with threads. It's going to be all bent. Uh, blah, blah, blah. You'll see it. Uh, what did I say? 35 minutes? Uh, let's see. It's been an hour. I had to change blades uh, and do some other things. Drill some relief holes. The blade wouldn't go around a circle, so I had to I had to drill holes in order to get the blade going the other direction, and it's just typical. That's what uh, that's the way it goes.
Okay, that bracket that we sawed out uh, just a little bit ago, I'm going to start grinding tapers in it and making it graceful and all that. That's the next step. Then after that, I'm going to kind of finely grind it. And then we're going to drill holes and we're going to tap threads. And then finally, we're going to bend it. But that's, uh, that's how we go move along in brackets. Okay, next step. You can see that uh, I've ground this, uh, ground these. Now you say, what are these, uh, these, these points here for? That's just, that's just art. Uh, but you can see the tapers uh, coming into it. And uh, besides using grindstones, uh, I use these flapper wheels. And uh, I didn't for a long, long time because I thought, boy, you know, sandpaper wheels on steel, what, what, what a waste. But they're wonderful. They're wonderful. They help you uh, make a taper, and if you use uh, fine enough ones, they can give you a finished appearance, which I haven't got yet. But uh, I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but I've got the uh, whole center punched. Uh, yeah, I think it does pick it up. And uh, that's so that I can start drilling the holes next. And then after that, I've got to bend these, and we'll see. I guess I should call this the... Uh the study of a bracket. So I'm drilling holes in it, and if you can see back here, I've got a C-clamp on it. I don't believe in uh, trying to cut short cuts by holding it with one hand, and then it grabs and things just get loused up. So, and if you'll notice, I'm always wearing glasses of some sort, some type, whether safety glasses or or something to protect my eyes. It's, it's, it's just so necessary. Jojo is going to take you through every step on making a bracket. This is a tap. And it, uh, if you can see the threads, I'm screwing it into there and it's cutting threads into the hole in that and it's going pretty good. Uh, that is so I can take this oiler that's got these threads on here and I'll be able to screw that into this bracket because this bracket, finally going to have to tell you, is going to be a bracket for a chain oiler. So, And this is the first time I'm using oil on this bracket. I didn't use it when we were sawing and I didn't actually use it when we were drilling. But I got the right size hole in it and uh, it's a tapered uh, pipe thread, so that means that the uh, the more you screw in the uh, the piece that we're going to screw in, the tighter it gets. Okay. Okay, you can see that I'm bending it cold. That's that bracket that we're making, that you and I are making. And this is the oiler that's going to uh, screw into it with the uh, threaded pipe tap. And uh, I already know it does. Okay, there it is. Okay. And the more you turn it in, the tighter it gets because it's, uh, it's got a taper on it. But it's going to sit like that. I'm going to file out these, these terrible marks I put in with pipe wrenches and clamps trying to bend it, uh, but I did bend it cold without a torch, and it's just going to be a 120-year-old uh, European blacksmith bracket, but there's so many more that we're making on this bike. Uh, lots of brackets, and uh, I just wanted to show you one. Uh, you can see, you can see everything kind of got moved over here, and uh, you're probably wondering what this is all about, but... <clears throat> These are all the scraps from the build. As I'm building, I'm tossing aside pieces that I could use later. You see steel that I cut brackets and levers out of. Uh, <clears throat> just scraps laying around <clears throat> later on. Uh, here's some 125-year-old carriage iron that came <clears throat> off of uh, off an old uh, carriage that was rotting away in the woods. I used pieces from that on the bike, which you'll be looking at. Here's some more steel cutouts uh, that I made, you know, for uh, 
brackets from Dan. So, but this is a lot of the scraps and stuff. And you say, well, why didn't I throw it out? You see, cutting brackets out of out of U channel. <clears throat> the reason I didn't throw it out, I'll sort it out later on when the project is all done, and the scrap will go to the scrap. But the trinkets and the brackets and everything, I'll keep for maybe a future project. Okay, this next part is just a little bit too good to not show you what I'm doing here. Uh, we already know that we're getting into the metal work, and we already know that I'm making brackets and things. This is the uh, the fork and the head race. Uh, put some paint on it. This is going to have the wooden uh, uh, sides that the front wheel will go in. Uh, you see the decal that uh, I'm starting to put decals on. And I just wanted to show you how to make those because uh, it might be something that, that uh, give you some tips for some other things. The way I'm making them, I'm going to get ahead of myself here a little bit, is I'm going to do with the charcoal right here. Okay. I laid a piece of paper on the actual object that I'm going to make the, uh, the uh, decals for. And then I'm taking this charcoal, and I'm got to keep it. You can't let it move. And I'm tracing around the object itself. Another hole goes here. I've got to get the reference point for where these decals go. Okay. And you'll get charcoal over your hand if you use charcoal, but you may do other things. You may not even build a wooden motorcycle. Okay. Now, set this aside. Set the charcoal aside. Now, I have the shape of the thing, and I'm going to freehand draw what I would like the decals that go on to look like. And I already know, I'm a pretty good freehander here. It'll be something like this. We're just going to do one right now. Whoops. Uh, these, these jags here, when I run in the knife, they won't be in there. All right. And I do the other one here. Uh, right now, I'm just uh, going to waste your time here because I've already done them, so I'm just showing you how I did it. Okay. Now, I have some of this red Scotch Cal material left over from other times. And uh, what I would do is tape this down to the red material and I would take a piece of carbon paper. Okay, that's the side. And I would put the carbon paper underneath and then I would draw what I would do. Camera's going and I'm going wiggly, but that that's all right. That's all right. And I'm going to want a decal like this. Then I have it on there. Then I take a utility knife, a little exacto knife actually, and I cut it out. And you'll get less waves with the knife if you're just going fast freehand. A little bit reckless. Take some practice. I've been doing this for a while. Okay, then I cut this out. Like so. Okay. You can wipe off the carbon. It comes off the carbon lines. I'm making smudges, but, uh, you know, uh, get a little bit of something, uh, uh, oil or something, and you get that off. Now then, should have prepared this a little bit better, but you take yeah. a pair of scissors. This is pre-mask. This, uh, this is what they apply to uh, decals to put them on. Stripes on cars, uh, signs on trucks. Uh, it's, it's basically like masking tape. Okay. Are you good? Huh? Okay. And I pre-mask it. 
Uh, I'm using a Formica roller to just pre-mask the piece that I made. And then I will lift it off and uh, it will follow the pre-mask and come off the backing, like so. Okay. Now, stay there. I have this piece that uh, I'm applying them to, and with the pre-mask, I can apply I have to see where the holes are, see where my point of reference is, and I can apply them like so. Yeah, okay. And if I wipe the uh, carbon paper off, I have put and I'll put one up here, and I already started this side, put one up here, and that's how I'm going to be making uh, some of these uh, red stripes to go on the curved, curved brackets. Okay, this is the shop, and uh, let's get started. We're going to start assembling some stuff. So, but the pr present project is this. We have uh, stained and varnished the frame. Uh, it's not furniture. <clears throat> it's not meant to be. Uh, it's, I left a lot of the chatter and tool marks in it <clears throat> on purpose. I wanted to have that feel of, of being 120 some years old, 130 years old. Uh, and also when it's all done, this is going to be the driver. It's going to be, if oil slops out of the engine, runs down the frame, people get on and scratch it with their shoes or whatever, uh, that's not going to matter. Also, <clears throat> while we were staining all that, I took a die grinder and ground off all of the uh, paint and stuff. And we uh, stained and varnished the uh, wheel. The sprocket I found somewhere and bored it out and welded it onto the hub. Uh, we're using uh, 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 modern ball bearings that uh, I, I wallowed out the uh, the hubs and inserted uh, <clears throat> brand new ball bearings in the wheels so that it'll actually uh, roll. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do today is put the back wheel in. And I've made, I sawed out these blocks of steel, they're heavy. They're actual solid blocks of steel. I drilled them for the axles of, of for the axle of the wheel, and uh, <clears throat> I put a little punch right and left, so I know which one goes on which side. And we're going to uh, try right now to assemble the back wheel in it. These were some of the brackets uh, you might remember yesterday when we were pinstriping thing. I mentioned about using iron from a hundred and some year old uh, buggy that I found rotted away in the woods. You can see all this is pitted, but rather than glaze fillet, I like the idea of the original pitted 120 some year old hardware whenever I can find it. Those will go on like this. This is the left side, this is the right. <clears throat> and we're going to try to do it. I put the bolts for each side left and right and uh, here goes going to be a dry dry run you'll see slots right here in the axle there's one on each side that's going to be so that when we put it all together there'll be bolts that will go through and catch part of the axle You can see the uh, all the cutouts in the in the frame. They had to be 
cut exactly right to fit the blocks. That was the least of my problems. Okay. And here we go as we try to put all this together. Very good. This is the uh, first time through. This isn't a uh, practice or whatever. Okay, now I have to turn the axle. We got the holes lined up. Everything's looking good. Uh, these are the uh, bars the, that will uh, gusset in the, uh, the wooden frame. Okay, while we were making things, <clears throat> this is going to be the jack shaft. I wanted a nice, great, big pulley. Now, <clears throat> originally, an old bike would have had a flat, flat pulley and flat leather belts, and I've done that kind of work on previous projects. But again, this is the driver, so I'm going to use modern V belt and modern type pulleys and chains. So, what we did is we machined. First we cut out this bracket, weld it on, and I left these holes so that when I put bolts through here, I can put the nuts on in here when the bolts go through. You'll see in a moment. It'll make sense. Then this, uh, this pulley goes to the uh, jack shaft of the engine, and this sprocket will go and drive the rear wheel. Uh, this will go on the bottom like this. And I have a nut and a washer that will go on here. Okay. Okay, you guys are sitting there watching while I'm sitting here turning the bolt. Okay, then. Again, I uh, <coughs> set this stuff aside. Now, whenever I can, I'm using square-headed nuts and bolts. And in this case... For the time being, I've got these CAD hex uh, bolts that I'm using. When I find square-headed ones, I'll replace them. Uh, just so you know, I spent a lot of time trying to find uh, hardware that would be of the period. Okay, and this will get all tightened up. This will get all tightened up. Lag bolts will go in there. Here's a square headed one. This will go down in here like, like so and, and screw in. And, and I'll do the other side. And now we have a wheel in place. Okay, we're uh, just chasing a few threads. Great grandpa's taps and die set. Grandpa's caps and dies. We did a lot of threading early on. Threading shafts and axles and all sorts of things. Okay, what we're going to do, this goes in here. You notice, I was talking about making the square, the square holes, but you see the square shank on these carriage bolts. There's no place to grab them. So when you tighten the nut, they have to be in these types of uh, holes like that. And I did it to all of this stuff. These are the outrigger stabilizer wheels. These happen to just be steel wheels with rubber tires that I found in a warehouse. And you go rubber tires back then, 100 and some years ago. I wanted, since they're small, I wanted them not clatter around. In time, I may change them out for just plain old wood or steel wheels. The uh, axles I machined and drilled lengthwise so that these grease cups here, when you tighten down the grease, the grease will go into the middle of the hub of the wheel and come out 
So you tighten them every now and then and it lubricates the wheels. You can see more of my uh, wonderful welding. I'm saying that because it's not wonderful, but it works. Now here's the deal. The deal is this. I welded all these up, the shaft into this, in this bolt. I don't know in this darkness if it shows up, but let's move this crank out of the way just a moment, but not too far. The idea here is, and these were made out of a piece of that new channel that we uh, said was in the junk over on the other side there. And the idea is that these will go on here, slide on, and these will pivot like this. Now, if you'll hold on just a moment, we're going to go ahead with the uh, bolt that we put in. We're going to lock tight the thread that's going to go in, and I'll clean up all of this after the camera's off, because this is going to drip on the floor. But we also want to add some grease to the outer part where it's going to pivot. Probably never again will this see grease, but uh, it will this one time, and it's not going to pivot or wear. It's not going to wear out. Okay. We will screw this in all the way. I could grab a wrench, but I've got this crescent here handy, so... Okay, the idea is that these wheels on both sides are going to pivot up and down when they're bolted on. They'll be spring-loaded. Uh, Daimler's original bike had leaf springs, but uh, this one's going to just have kind of a mechanical pivot because I like this idea. I've done it before. Okay. Let's see. moment. Okay, now that other piece will swing around there. The bolt that we just tapped will go up through here. Works good if you're not on camera. Abbreviate some of this later. Okay. Now, This is the cranking mechanism for the engine. Another grease cup in there so that when you tighten it, the grease will lubricate that. This got sawed out of a blank piece of steel, made a little wooden handle, uh, sawed all this out, welded it to a plate, uh, and it's going to go right on here. And uh, with that in mind, I'm looking for one washer which I'll get later. Oops. And we will put two bolts in through here. tighten up a few things here later but okay see the way that wheel pivots okay it's going to have a spring on this end 
And I made all these pieces and sunk them in with epoxy. I'm going to have a spring on this end, and this is going to be a plunger. And uh, I'm going to put a little, little uh, grease on here, just where it pivots underneath on the leaf and where it comes through. And again, it doesn't uh, rely on the grease uh, as far as its movement goes, but it doesn't hurt a darn thing to have a little grease on it. There's a the rag. Okay. And that will go up through there. Like so. Okay. The spring will be in here. Hopefully like so. Yeah. And... Uh, this uh, spacer will be on here. And then this big delicious wing nut, which I found a pair of. That will go down there and uh, when the weight is on the uh, when the weight is on the rear wheels, this will pull down on the spring and we will tighten we will put tension on it based on leveling out the bike and it will be able to rock back and forth, pivot like you saw. And, uh, and all will be fine. Okay. We're going to be uh, putting the wheel, the fork, head race, handlebars, all that in next. And I'm going to do that when you're not looking because it's going to take 45 minutes to an hour and a half of mistrials and this and that. But I want to show you all the parts. And you've got to use your imagination a little bit about what's happening. This is the fork. I sawed it out of a half inch plate. Bend it with a torch. It's not quite that easy. You see it's narrower here than here. Uh, actually sawed it upright in a bandsaw to get it narrower. And then just filed and blah, blah, blah. You can understand. Uh, the shaft welded it in. Made this piece. Welded it all in. And uh, took this. This might be bicycle bearings. I don't know. But when I machined this piece, I made a uh, groove in there so that these bearings will sit in there in turn when the fork's turning. Now the wheels don't attach to it, uh, but this I think is oak. Made two of these. Again, the steel block that the uh, front wheel axle will go through and then a, a, a straight bolt goes through that to keep the axle from spinning and the wood from splitting. Okay, but those will bolt onto here, like so, with carriage bolts. Again, the square hole, square holes, so that they don't spin while you're tightening them. But these will bolt on like that. Now, this, if you haven't figured out, will come up through, like so, and this will stick up out here. Again, grease cuffs. I think I mentioned that a dozen times. All right. I think you're getting the picture. So now, if we're going to do that, we're going to need handlebars. And the handlebars are this. Again, I machined a big block of steel, drilled out the hole, uh, tapped the set screw in. These will go on here like so. Rather than bend a piece of steel like this, I sawed out a uh, three-quarter inch thick piece of plate. And then somewhere around here, I welded it together with a piece of bar stock, which I tapered. You notice it's narrower here than it is here. Tapered it on a lathe. Put these on. Threaded it. And for handle grips, I went to Goodwill, and I bought a, uh, a meat roller, just a big, fat meat roller. And I cut it into two pieces. It already had the hole drilled in it for the handles of the meat roller. And I turned it down on a lathe, stained and varnished, and I made these, these handle grips. Uh, in time, I'll epoxy them on. And again, you can, you can see from back here how it's going to look. It's going to, this is going to be a high machine. This is going to be uh, pretty high. This, I think I already said, down inside here has steel ears welded inside the frame so that you can't really see but uh, my camera person is trying and they they may they be blessed for that but these bolts 
And this is part of collecting hardware. I mean, where do you go to a hardware store and find stuff like, like this? Square-headed nuts and bolts, big stuff like this. But these will go through. And uh, they not only hold the uh, head race squeezed together, but they hold all, whoops, whoops. They hold all these, this is unrehearsed, things fall, drop, everything. Uh, they will hold all these pieces together, which, as you know from before, have all these little dowel pins inside, uh, dozens of them, and lots of glue sandwiched all together. So the next thing is uh, off camera. I'm going to assemble all of this stuff. Oh, we talked about the wheel. Yeah, I said there is a wheel. That's the star of the show. And it's an, it's an Amish buggy wheel, the same as the back. But I went ahead and I ground out the hubs and I put ball bearings in. Yeah, I put ball bearings. My dad had a bunch of alternator uh, bearings from the 1960s. So I've got ball bearings and stuff where it doesn't show. The shaft is drilled for a through bolt so that it won't spin. And again, I there's this was all thick Amish paint. And I ground it all off and I left it bumpy. The idea is that this thing is supposed to look like it's 100 years old when it's done. But this was a nice wheel. And uh, stay tuned. When we have a front wheel on it, then we'll we'll be back. Okay, I don't know if this is clear on camera, but uh, this is what I'm doing: painting square-headed nuts and bolts, and and uh, this is all the kind of hardware that we're going to put it all together with. There's so much more than just this, but this is the kind of thing we do, and it's each one's got to be kept in order. Okay, just just so you know, that's some of the little little details. Okay, this is the, the seat, not at this angle, but let's make it a little more self-explanatory. Kind of heavy. It's going to go on the bike like this, and there's a wooden saddle, which I've already made, which will go on it. Uh, it'll bolt on. There'll be uh, levers that'll bolt here. This will go on the frame. This will go on the frame. Uh, one of the things about this is this is all old, these pieces here are all old carriage iron that I found, again, in the weeds. I explained about some of that. And you go, well, what's the difference between that and, and buying new bar stock? Uh, one of the differences is the price. And the other is that I'm kind of making a living organism out of this thing. And anything that can breathe through the paint old, uh, maybe I'm just jabbering, but I like the idea of old. Now, I welded this all together, and these round thing hoops that that the uh, seat will sit on happen to be the same diameter as the saw blade I used for sawing the wood saddle through sideways through the blade so that it will sit perfectly round on on here as you'll see not this minute but coming up soon you see that the other day we were talking about all those parts that we're going to assemble to put the front wheel and the head race and the handlebars together well this is it, and uh, you can see the handlebars are going to be pretty high, but the seat's going to sit about here, so it's going to be a high rider, and uh, it, we're coming along. You can see here, standing in the light, a lot of the uh, bar stock, pieces of thick wall pipe, stuff that you can't get in a hardware store that you'd pay premium for if you were going to go to a, uh, you know, a... Uh, steel place and buy. You can see all sorts of stuff, and there's stuff you can't see. But all of this is what I'm working out of the build. And again, whenever I start a project, I usually start collecting stuff a couple years in advance. So this helps immensely. Okay, what I'm doing, I'm sandblasting. This is a tank full of black uh, black sand, and uh, it's got uh, air pressure to it, and it's spraying sand, and it's taking all the rust and paint. See, it's got kind of a mat. Uh, you can't feel it, but paint will stick to this better. And since these are the footrests that are going to have people's feet wearing it off all the time, I need some good paint adhesion. 
I didn't do this one yet. You see all the rust? I'm going to get. I'm going to sandblast that down to bare metal. All this crud. But these are the footrests I made, and uh, part of my old, uh, uh, old uh, not stagecoach, but old carriage uh, brackets that I'm incorporating into my new welding. I I took a, a piece of long angle iron, and I cut slits and bent, bent. Then I had this piece of heavy uh, steel mesh. And I didn't do a great job welding it in underneath, but uh, it's going to be all right because you won't see it, and it is strong. But these are the footrests, and I'm sandblasting them. It's a Bernoulli's principle thing. The uh, air passing through the sand creates a uh, lesser vacuum, and it sucks the sand out. And that's what I got. you got to wear a helmet. you got to take care of your eyes. Okay, here's the mechanism for the brake and the... Uh, the brake and the clutch. And I made this quadrant. Actually, I made it for another project a long, long time ago, and I never used it. But this handle, it's got, it's got a button. This handle came off an old drill press or something. But uh, this handle makes, I've got indents where it goes in. Okay, let's see what this does. Now, these rods, I happen to, uh, my son bought a uh, early 1920s building. And it had a bunch of wrought iron and stuff laying in there. And I took the opportunity to uh, own about three 20-foot lengths of this spiral iron. And I thought it'd just make a wonderful-looking uh, uh, maybe period linkage for, for this old bike. But let's, let's move down here. And when I move that lever up above, uh, this is what happens down here. And again, we have our grease cups for the uh, pivoting axle. But you'll see... That when with my right hand, when I move this in one direction, I've got an aluminum block that I made, which is going to scrape against the rear wheel. Like a, see the wheel turns, and when you put the brake on, uh, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't. So in one direction of the lever up front, it's a brake. The other direction, the other uh, thing here go, is going to go down to a tight and loose uh, uh, idler pulley. Uh, I just don't have it all hooked up yet. And when the brake comes off, the, uh, this lever here will come up and pull the belt tight, and you'll go. So in one direction, you stop. In the other direction, you go. Very simple. Okay, now back up here again. I made this little lever, welded it onto a, a little mower uh, uh, throttle switch, which I cut off here and welded this cute little uh, thing onto it. And this is going to go back and forth and adjust the uh, engine speed. There'll be no governor on the engine. It'll just be uh, hooked up to the throttle and it's uh, faster this way and back. So just want to show you some of this linkage before it gets buried. But these are the segments of wood that uh, I put together to make a seat. This curve uh, fits the uh, diameter of the uh, saw blade going sideways when I made these pieces. And now they're assembled. I, I carved them a bit, put these two studs in. They will go in these holes, and the seat will sit. Can't see. There we go. It's real simple. I just couldn't see. The seat will sit on here like this. And in case you're thinking, well, it's going to get folded down, it isn't going to because... The engine sitting in here, the gas tank will be right in this area right here. And by just taking the seat off, you'll be able to fill the gas tank and then put the seat right back on like so. Okay, it's, it's engine time. Uh, motorcycle is not a motorcycle without an engine. And what I've picked for an engine after uh, throwing away a lot of ideas is about a 1922-1923 Briggs and Strat Model PB. And uh, if you look down here, you'll see uh, lots of uh, parts. Actually, I got more parts than that, and a lot of that looks pretty rough, but I think by picking out the best of this or that, that I can put together an engine that would be at least semi-dependable. And then uh, I'll have some uh, extra parts. Now, one of the things that I want to show you about this engine uh, that I think is neat 
is it's got an atmospheric intake valve. And if we can look at this, if you see the spring here, and I'm pushing open, you see the valve pushes open? Well, it doesn't work mechanically in the engine. What happens is the vacuum, the suction of the piston going down, sucks the valve open. And that's how the gas uh, mixture goes in. It's not mechanically operated. And it makes kind of a snorting, wheezy sound, which is kind of neat too. But uh, it's its own governor because it'll only flap so fast and then the engine just, just won't do it anymore. And another thing about it is here's one of the crankshafts, and I think I got a better one than this. But you'll see that this small uh, uh, camshaft gear, this is the uh, flywheel side, the taper, but the small camshaft gear will unite with, oh, camera's running, how do I show you this? Okay, you see this, this curved piece here? That's this piece here. And in the engine, the uh, Crankshaft gear will unite with a great big round 8 to 1 ratio uh, camshaft gear. And normally an engine has a 2 to 1 gear and has one cam lobe uh, uh, for, for that, that, uh, that ratio. But this engine has four cam loads for the exhaust, which is mechanically operated, because it's an 8 to 1 ratio. And that's kind of neat. So I just wanted to show you that now. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buff parts. I'm going to uh, mic some parts and I'm going to find the best of everything I can and see if I can put together an engine without uh, doing any machining or, or looking all over the world for, for parts. It is kind of a rare engine, but I think it'll be uh, kind of with the times. It ought to run about 800, 900 RPMs. And with the snorting and wheezing, I, I just think it'll be neat. Uh, we put together an engine out of a lot of humble parts, and this is it. Let me uh, show it to you. This is the shroud side and uh, flywheel inside of it. Now, you'll notice that the cylinder is rusty. I did not uh, buff out the cylinder or paint it. Uh, Everything is going to do what it's going to do, and I wanted to have the least amount of heat restriction on that cylinder as possible. Uh, the carburetor is a float carburetor and normally goes on the other side, but because of the way the frame of the motorcycle is all, uh, it's just going to have to be here, and that's fine. Electric ignition, whereas Daimler had hot tube. Uh, one of the things about it is when, when it's all in, this spark plug won't be able to be reached from either side because of the way the motorcycle is. So I drilled a hole here that just barely fits uh, the uh, spark plug, or the, the wires on it the spark plug so I can go in there if the spark plugs foul and take it out through the front or change it. It's going to have an exhaust that comes through here. Uh, this again I mentioned before about the 8 to 1 gear ratio and then the four, lo the four uh, cam lobes only works the exhaust. The intake is uh, suction. So that's the engine. Now while you're here, uh, we came along, we put footrests, footrests on the bike, Got the jack shaft in. Uh, just a lot of the uh, things down there I think are looking good. I think we already talked about, didn't we talk about the uh, this already? Okay, so we know how all the uh, leakage is going to work. And that should be it. Okay, uh, we've got this far. You may remember back when we first made a uh, steel bracket together, starting on the bandsaw, cutting it out, and the different stages. Well, this here is the bracket that uh, that we made, and it's for a oiler. This you fill with uh, oil. You can see it in the glass, and it will drip onto the chain. Uh, you can adjust up here. You can adjust the amount of drip, and it will keep the chain oiled. It's more cosmetics than anything because at the speed we're going, this this chain isn't going to really need need oiling. It's, but anyway, so this is that bracket that that we made, and I bent it and uh, formed it. You can see it's bolted on. Here's the whole picture of it. And you can also see that it lines up with the uh, chain to drip on the chain. So that's that.
We're about ready to go. We're about ready to go. And we got the engine in. That's the gas tank up there, up above, right here. You can see a carburetor down in here. And uh, tighten the loose belt. I wish I had another hand because when the uh, idler pulley, which is back in here, goes up, this belt, belt tightens and it just does so nicely. It's a big enough pulley that there's no slippage, but it grabs gradually. Foot rests are on. All the linkage in the back. Maybe I can move some of it. You can see as I move the uh, lever up front, the back and forth stuff. Okay, this is this is the big one. This is what we've been waiting for. We've been building for a year and a half, close to two years. We're out on a parking lot here in Carrollton, Ohio, and uh, we're going to do it. Now, there's a compression release on here. Remember, I told you we're geared eight to one on the camshaft, and we're cranking the camshaft, so it's really tough. A little bit of gas, no choke. of the camshaft. Take the one, the engine is running eight times that speed. I just 
shut the gas off and they'll let it run out of gas. Brake is on. Time to go home and start a new project.